Ireland and Palestine Center. Uh, on behalf of our board of directors and staff, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today, including everybody watching online. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to introduce and welcome our distinguished speakers from Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Uh, we have Nadia Hijab, uh, Zina Agha, and Yara Hawari. Uh, 2018 marks 70 years since the Nakba and Israel's dispossession of the Palestinian people and violation of their rights. Yet, an end to their oppression and displacement remains out of reach. Indeed, the discourse about what constitutes Palestine and the Palestinian people has been steadily circumscribed during this period, and the focus on the ephemeral two-state solution has excluded the majority of Palestinians from the quest for a just peace. Nadia Hijab, who is the executive director of Al-Shabaka, along with Zina Agha and Yara Hawari, the policy fellows of Al-Shabaka, will discuss how reframing the narrative on Palestine could help further the Palestinian struggle for freedom. So just a little bit about uh, the speakers. Uh, Nadia Hijab is the co-founder and executive director of Al-Shabaka and a writer, public speaker, and media commentator. Her first book, Woman Power, the Arab Debate on Women at Work, was published by Cambridge University Press, and she co-authored Citizens Apart, a portrait of Palestinians in Israel. She's a co-founder and former chair of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and now serves on its advisory board. Zina Agha is the U.S. Policy Fellow for Al Shabaka. Her areas of expertise include Israeli settlement policy, related mapping efforts, and the status of Jerusalem. She has previously worked at the Iraqi Embassy in Paris and the Palestinian delegation at UNESCO. Zina's media credits include The Independent, The Nation, PRI's The World, uh, the BBC World Service, and BBC Arabic. She was awarded a Kennedy Scholarship to study at Harvard University, where she completed her master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, Yara Hawari is the Palestine Policy Fellow of Al Shabaka. She completed her PhD in Middle East Politics at the University of Exeter, where she focused on oral history projects and memory politics within an indigenous studies framework. Her other areas of expertise include the Palestinian citizens of Israel and Jerusalem. Her articles have been published in The Independent, Al Jazeera English, and Middle East Eye. Her previous professional experience includes working at Kenyon Institute in East Jerusalem and the Refugee Studies Center at the University of Oxford. Uh, Nadia, Zina, and Yara will each speak for about 15 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. And as always, we ask that you please wait for the mic to come to you before you ask your questions so that everybody online can hear as well. And for the online audience, you can tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. And uh, also just to let you know, we have a, a sign-up sheet for Al Shabaka and some flyers uh, next to the door where all the other flyers are. So please, uh, please sign up when, on your way out. Uh, without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Nadia Hijab, Zina Agha, and Yara Hawari. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming here today, and thank you, Mohammed, for the, the introduction. Um, as was mentioned, it's been 70 years um, of Nakba, and the Palestinian people, as a result, remain socially, geographically, and politically fragmented. There are Palestinians in the diaspora virtually in every corner of the world. There are Palestinian refugees in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria. And over the last six years um, since the war in Syria, an increasing number have made their way to Europe. There are also Palestinians in the West Bank, in Gaza, and there are Palestinians in present-day Israel. This geographic fragmentation is, of course, no accident, um, and neither is the mainstream discourse and definitions of, uh, on who and what constitutes as Palestinian. Mainstream international, um, or rather mainstream Israeli and international discourse limits Palestinians to the West Bank and Gaza. And some of the more right-wing discourse even eliminates them entirely and refers to them simply as Arabs, severing their connection with Palestine. Now, the peace negotiation discourse is slightly more inclusive and it will include the Palestinian refugees because of UNRWA. But this does not translate into a recognition of their rights to return to their homes. Most discussions on Palest Palestine and Palestinians on a policy level fall short on encompassing the Palestinian people in their entirety. Uh, and this is one of the major downfalls. So I'm going to briefly talk about the, uh, an oft-forgotten uh, group of Palestinians, uh, and these are the Palestinian citizens of Israel, 
who today number about 1.8 million um, and who make up 21% of Israel's population. The Palestinian citizens of Israel were the remnants of Palestinian society in 1948, uh, and whilst 750 of their brothers and sisters were expelled, around 150,000 remained within the borders of the new state. Uh, and these pockets in which they remained were mostly focused in the, in the south, with a few Bedouin populations, um, some areas in the Triangle region, um, some villages in the Galilee, and a few populations remained uh, in the cities. From 1948 until 1966, this population was placed under military rule, which restricted every aspect of their lives. And in particular, there was a lot of political repression and enforced isolation from the rest of the Arab world. The military rule ended in 1966, and one year later we saw Israel occupy the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights in the Six-Day War. In Palestinian terminology, or Arab terminology, this became known as the Naqsa, um, and historic Palestine was geographically reunited. And Palestinians across the Green Line were, um, could share their experiences after being two decades <coughs> apart. Naturally, over the years, relationships were re-established and there was a relative amount of fluidity between the West Bank, Gaza, and the rest of historic Palestine. These, uh, this flu fluidity and these relationships were once again disrupted with the building of the separation wall in the early 2000s. Um, now, in the early years uh, after the establishment of the State of Israel, there was a discussion on what to do with these Palestinians um, who remained. There were many discussions on expulsion and population transfer, but in the end it was decided that they would be granted citizenship. Um, now, this was done on the understanding that this citizenship would be nominal and would never be full. A common phrase is that Palestinians in Israel are second-class citizens, um, but I don't think that this phrase gives a complete picture um, of reality. In Israel, citizenship um, and nationality are distinct terms and categories, unlike most countries where the two are interchangeable. So whilst there is such a thing as Israeli citizenship, there is no Israeli nationality. Rather, nationality is designated along ethnic religious lines. And actually in Israel, there are about 137 possible nationalities, including Jewish, Arab, and Druze. These, uh, these nationalities are recorded on the identity cards and in the registry databases. But because the state defines itself um, constitutionally as Jewish, it is therefore those with Jewish nationality who trump the non-Jewish population. So whilst European states might categorize themselves uh, as Christian, culturally, or historically, uh, constitutionally, but constitutionally, the rights to full citizenship are not premised on that. As the Jewish nation and the state of Israel are considered to be one of the same, the exclusion of non-Jewish citizens is a rather predictable consequence. The differentiation between citizenship and nationality allows for a very sophisticated and covert racist system, which is not necessarily detectable to the unknowing observer. And this system essentially divides people into two categories, Jews and non-Jews. Uh, and Palestinians are designated as is Israeli Arabs, which not only serves as part of this binary exclu exclusion mechanism, it also attempts to negate their Palestinian identity, whilst at the same time allowing Israel to portray itself as uh, a multicultural and diverse state. Now, this citizenship and nationality issue has been challenged several times um, in Israeli courts by both Palestinian citizens and Israeli Jews. But thus far, the Israeli Supreme Court have rejected all petitions to change the law on the basis that Israeli nationality would technically open up inclusion for non-Jewish citizens and would challenge the Zionist underpinning of Israel as a Jewish nation state. Now, most of the Palestinian citizens uh, of Israel live in Arab-only villages and towns, with a few living in the so-called mixed cities. Um, and it's important to note that the segregation of these populations uh, is neither accidental nor a natural residential pattern. The villages that survived the ethnic cleansing in 1948 had many of their lands appropriated and expropriated, and expansion since has not been permitted. As a result, these Arab towns and villages suffer from severe overcrowding um, with no opportunity of relief through development or growth. And in addition, since 1948, not a single new Arab town or village has been built. 
Um, so essentially the goal of the Israeli state with regards to these Palestinians is the same goal um, as with other Palestinian communities, to squeeze as many Palestinian Arabs into as little space as possible. If Palestinians leave their towns or villages of origin, they are restricted from purchasing or leasing land through two main mechanisms. Firstly, admissions committees, and secondly, the discriminatory policies pursued by the JNF, the Jewish National Fund, and the state authorities. The admissions committees um, have been continuously upheld by the High Court despite challenges against it. Basically, what they are is rural communities which set up admissions committees that assess the social suitability <coughs> of potential residents. So in this way, Palestinian applicants can be legally rejected on the very basis that they're not Jewish. So in practice, this has had very devastating consequences for Palestinian spaces in 1948 um, borders, Israel proper. In the Galilee, which is in no northern Israel, um, where there is a Palestinian majority population, this has led to furious attempts by the government to Judaize the region, which includes uh, circling uh, Palestinian villages with Israeli, uh, Jewish Israeli settlements to prevent geographic contiguity. Uh, the Galilee also reveals the Israeli state's preoccupation with demographics, and in particular its fear of the rising Palestinian population. And this fear has also played out in the south, in the Negev, uh, where there is a continued displacement and forced relocation of tens of thousands of Palestinian Bedouins. Now, in order to counter these racist policies and to challenge their overall treatment by the state, Palestinians in Israel have created a civil society space that is pretty much separate uh, from its Jewish-Israeli counterpart. Uh, Palestinian civil society initially developed to make up for the services that the state fa failed to provide its Palestinian citizens. However, over the last two decades, there's been a burgeoning of civil society organizations working explicitly on political mobilization and Arab-Palestinian identity and cultural preservation. Now, these activities are uh, wide-ranging and diverse, and they include art, cinema, uh, theatre, um, and they're all very political because in their very nature they express a Palestinian identity and a Palestinian narrative. Some more uh, perhaps interesting recent political developments among this community um, um, include uh, uh, the, the publication of a series of documents called the Future Vision Documents. These were published between 2006 and 2007 and came out of a political context of total frustration from being marginalized from the Israeli state and being marginalized at the same time from the Palestinian national movement. So what these documents were was a, coll a collective effort from politicians, intellectuals, um, civil society. And basically they laid out social and political demands of the Palestinian community in Israel. They put forward a cohesive Palestinian narrative. Um, these documents didn't present new ideas, but rather what they did was consolidate uh, what Palestinian academics, organizers, and activists have been calling for for decades. Um, and they had a very clear picture of, of an imagined future. This included equal rights, equal and full rights within the state of Israel, um, and that the state would become a, a state for all its citizens, ending the occupation of the 1967 territories, as well as the right of return for refugees. Now, unfortunately, these documents haven't gained much traction, um, but if developed, I think, um, and worked on with Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and the diaspora, they could really lay the foundation for a collective Palestinian vision uh, for the future. Another interesting political development um, took the form of the joint list in the 2015 um, Knesset elections, uh, the Knesset being the Israeli parliament. Now, this was the first time all major Arab parties uh, in Israel joined together on a single list. Israel has an electoral uh, list system. Uh, and the reason they did it in 2015 was because they were trying to prevent Netanyahu from forming a government. The joint list um, was headed and is headed by Ayman Ode, and they won a total of 13 seats, making it the third largest party in the Knesset. And they managed to mobilize about two-thirds of the Palestinian uh, citizens to vote, which was quite phenomenal because usually many Palestinians within Israel um, take a, a boycott stance towards uh, Knesset elections. Um, during the elections itself, when it was apparent that the joint list was gaining in popularity, 
Netanyahu actually released a video on social media in which he said the following. The right-wing government is in danger. Arab voters are heading to the polls stations in droves. Left-wing NGOs are bringing them in buses. Uh, now, this discourse might be very uncomfortable to us, but it's actually quite common to hear in Israeli politics um, uh, where Palestinian citizens are likened to animals or a sort of hegemonic mass that can be sort of driven or taken on buses. Um, now, the jointness hoped that their increase uh, in seats would help them um, be able to prevent racist bills, such as the, the 2012 Prowl Plan, which I'll explain shortly, um, which seeks to relocate 90,000 Palestinian Bedouins um, in the south. Um, my analysis is that the joint list is not naive. Um, it doesn't think that it can drastically change the system from within, but I think it does hope that can, well, it did at the time hope that it could alleviate some of the hardships um, of daily life for Palestinians in Israel and also highlight and bring attention um, to their specific case. Unfortunately, however, Netanyahu cemented a coalition deal that would see the formation of Israel's most right-wing government to date. Um, the aforementioned government prow plan um, received a lot of attention in 2013, um, particularly because on the 30th of November, the day before the Knesset's second vote on the plan, a collective day of rage was organised by activists around the country and across the Green Line. Demonstrations were held in Gaza, Bidisama, Ramallah, um, Jerusalem, Yaffa, Bethlehem and the Galilee, all in solidarity with the Nakab, the Negev Bedouin, facing display displacement. These collective political manifestations across the Green Line were met with the same repression from the Israeli authorities. And it's this repression that un unifies the Palestinian experience. Now, just a final um, point, because I'm running out of time. Um, another example of political solidarity across the Green Line is that of BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanction Movement. And this has recently been developing a lot um, amongst the Palestinian community in Israel. And particularly, there are a lot of conversations about normalization. Normalization um, here refers to a concept that was developed by the movement, which argues that Israel must not be treated like any other country or enjoy normal relations. Practically, this means not having relations with Israeli initiatives, institutions, organizations, and so on, um, that are not openly against uh, Israeli oppression and colonization. For Palestinians in Israel, this can obviously be a huge challenge, as interactions with the state and its institutions are unavoidable. So specific guidelines have been developed that recognizes the difference between necessary relations and normalizing relations. For example, funding from the state for cultural projects constitutes as normalization, as it's possible um, to get funding elsewhere. But going to a state school is not because it's necessary um, as part of daily life. But I can go into BDS um, further in the, in the question time. Now, just to end, um, my sort of brief intervention here it was not to isolate this, this fragment of the um, Palestinian people from the other Palestinians, but rather to highlight the nuances and specific characteristics um, that um, they face under an overall system of Israeli oppression, which affects all Palestinians where they might be, wherever they might be. And I really think this should be part of our reframing effort to expand the discussion of Palestine and Palestinians beyond the 1967 borders, particularly this year as we approach the 70th anniversary of the Nakba and we remain geographically fragmented and still far from achieving full rights. Thank you. Thank you, Yara, and thank you, uh, Mohammed, and uh, other organizers at the Palestine Center for having us here today. Um, so as was mentioned at the beginning and repeated by Yara, next month we do commemorate 70 years um, since the loss of the Palestinian homeland and the expulsion of 750,000 Palestinian Arabs um, from Palestine who are still awaiting their return uh, and trapped in a political limbo. And of course, last year marked 50 years since the... Um, since the Nexus, since the 1967 war, and the reality that between the river and the sea, Israel controls everyone and everything in it in one single stratified system. In the time that I have, though, I'd really like to discuss uh, the state of, status of Jerusalem and the annexation attempts that are happening uh, in the West Bank 
not only because the imminent move of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem next month, but also because Israel's brazen attempts of the West Bank, among other factors, mean that Palestine really is facing an existential moment. In the 50 years since Israel has captured Jerusalem, Israel has limited Palestinian power, ownership, and habitation in the Jerusalem area on the one hand, while increasing Jewish-Israeli <coughs> presence and control on the other. While Jerusalem was the only officially annexed part of Palestine, uh, Palestinian territory since 1967, the nationalist right wing in Israel has long since advocated the full annexation of the West Bank, otherwise known as the Occupied Palestinian Territories. And since the, uh, over the last year, the current Benjamin Netanyahu government has presented a slew of plans, resolutions and bills which would tighten Israel's grip on Jerusalem. This, was, this is, of course, you know, uh, elevated by Trump's green light. But Israeli politicians, administrators, and planners have also presented thousands of housing units to be built in, in the Jerusalem area and also deep into the occupied Palestinian territory. Now, of course, as we know, the establishment of settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories is a violation of, the 40, of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Um, and the larger Israeli scheme to annex the West Bank requires a demographic ma uh, majority and, of course, the expansion of the settlements that we see all over the West Bank. The multitude of bills introduced, such as the now shelved Greater Jerusalem Bill and the Ariel Bill, which, of course, extends Israeli uh, law into uh, the universities and the settlements, have usually been introduced by the hawkish right-wing Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked from the Jewish Home Party. They mostly, on the whole, seek to apply Israeli law to the settlements, um, which would essentially blur the green line even further and bring the settlements into the fold um, of the Israeli state, amounting, in other words, to an annexation. An annexation would irrevocably sever Palestinians from their capital, Jerusalem, it would, it would Judaize the city demographically and spatially, and it would colonize the narrowest part of the West Bank, making a contiguous Palestinian state all but impossible. Now, fundamental to both of these outcomes is the, is the proposed annexation of the larger city settlement known as Ma, called Ma'al um, and the strip of land that connects it to Jerusalem, which is known as the E1 corridor. Ma'al for those who don't know, is located next to Jericho in the occupied Palestinian territory, and it functions as a Jewish suburb of Jerusalem. It boasts a population of about 40,000 people, um, and demographically, its inclusion in Jerusalem would drastically increase the number of Jewish Israelis um, who are considered residents of Jerusalem. But it's intended, and when it was built, it was really built with this intention to achieve two overarching goals. First, to strategically penetrate deep into the occupied Palestinian territories, and second, to consolidate Israel's grip on Jerusalem. Around 70% of Ma'al Adumim's residents commute daily to Jerusalem for work, barely noticing the crossing of the Green Line, of course, a privilege reserved only to Jewish Israeli citizens. Um, and Ma'al Adumim, along with the Palestinian, uh, a lot, sorry, along with the neighboring settlements in Palestinian territory, which have sprung up uh, around Ma'al Adumim, they fall as, form a sweeping built up area um, which interpose the Palestinian landscape and isolate Palestinians from their capital, Jerusalem. It is, in other words, the jewel of the settlement crown of the Israeli colonizing project. Now, any annexation um, of Ma'al Adumim or any other part of the West Bank would depend on the acquisition of a strategically significant parcel of land called the E1 Corridor, which is only measures about 12 kilometers uh, squared. Um, and it's located in Area C, which is Israeli controlled. Um, its primary objective in acquiring E1 is to really secure Ma'al Adumim's continuity with, um, with Israel and Jerusalem by creating an urban Jewish bloc um, but, uh, in the West Bank. This would bolster Israel's grip on East Jerusalem by dwarfing its neighboring Palestinian districts with Jewish neighborhoods, while also you know, applying the final nail in the coffin to this two-state solution. Now, recognizing the spatial and political difficulties um, of annexing this parcel of land, Israel is building the Eastern Ring Road, otherwise dubbed as the Apartheid Road, but due to the wall that runs down its middle, um, which separates Israeli from Palestinian motorists. And it's intended to facilitate Palestinian travel between the North and South West Bank to ensure a transportational contiguity. But it's also meant to better connect Israeli settlements to Jerusalem while severing Palestinian motorists from accessing Jerusalem.
The implication of the road is devastating to Palestinians' freedom of movement from their future, from their future capital. For many Palestinians in the occupied territory, Jerusalem is their economic and cultural center of life. The building of the separation wall over a decade ago through parts of the West Bank and around the existing settlements have already denied Palestinians access to Jerusalem. Palestinians holding West Bank IDs can no longer do business, study, receive medical care or visit friends and family without permission from the Israeli security apparatus. Moreover, the religious significance of such an annexation should not be downplayed. Jerusalem is home to many of the most religious sites um, for Muslim and Christian Palestinians, including the Noble Sanctuary, including uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Annexation would only exacerbate the religious restrictions imposed on Palestinians who were denied rights to, to worship freely at their holy sites. Most significantly, however, and something I would really like to dwell on in the time that I have, is implementation and implementing any annexation or settlement in the E1 area would require the immediate expulsion of the Bedouin Palestinians living on the land, another violation of international law. At present, there are approximately 2,700 Palestinians, Palestinian Bedouins, half of whom are children in the Ma'al Adumim vicinity. The majority of these communities come from the Jehalin tribe. The, Israelis, the Israeli authority have deliberately deprived Jahalin of access to their most basic services, such as water and electricity, which makes their, their existence on that land intolerable. They are not allowed to work or build on the land, and the military limits their access to their allotted farmland, which of course for, is used for grave, grazing their stock, which forces them to depend on purchasing costly fodder uh, for their sheep. And herders have been obliged in recent years to sell their livestock, with the result that only 30% of the residents continue to earn a living from livestock. The rest work as labourers, usually in the nearby settlements. And under the current E1 plans, the Jahalina are to be expelled and relocated in three townships. This forces a lifestyle onto the Bedouin that runs anathema to their nomadic existence. In the context of a military occupation, any transfer of protected persons such as these communities, which includes the confiscation of their land or the destruction of property by the, occup by the occupying power, represents a gross breach of international law. By extension, any military plan which is intended to permanently relocate occupied people is considered a war crime. Yet despite the clear international legal framework condemning these practices, Israel's attempt to relocate the Bedouins does continue, using Israeli domestic law as a tool to obfuscate Bedouin and Palestinian claims to the land. This all ties into decades of established Israeli policy, which is characterized by land confiscation, creeping annexation, demographic manipulation, and popula population transfer. And of course, this is not unique to the Bedouins or to the Palestinians living in the West Bank, as Yara mentioned. The Bedouin communities living in the Naqab or the Negev, in the Negev Desert, are also living uh, in a uh, very precarious condition in so-called unrecognized villages, and despite being Israeli citizens, they are a perpetual threat of expulsion. And I'm thinking most vividly here of the Umm al-Hiran uh, village, which is intended to be cleared of its Bedouin Palestinians, and a Jewish settlement called Hiran to be built in its space. Population transfer, namely the removal of Palestinian Arabs and settlement of Jewish Israelis in their place, really isn't a new phenomenon. And it, ties, and it lies at the root of the Palestine-Israel conflict as we understand it. While Israeli annexation attempts should be understood as a thirst for pal Palestinian land, Palest uh, forced population transfer of Palestinians should be understood as a desire for an ethnically homogenous Jewish population. The Nekba, or catastrophe, again denoting 750,000 Palestinians being removed of their land, cannot and should not be understood as a single moment in history. Rather, as the Bedouins in E1 and Umm al Hiran will attest, it's a process of ongoing dispossession and displacement. This is what cannot be forgotten and should not be underestimated. It is in this context that we should understand the return march that has been taking place in Gaza over the last two weeks. Since, since, March 30, since the 30th of March, <clears throat> sorry, Israel has killed more than 31 Palestinian peaceful demonstrators and wounded more than 2,500, including children and young people. The Israelis' authorities have done this openly and without shame. 
The threat from these protesters lies precisely in the indisputable fact that the Palestinians have not forgotten where they are from, nor that they have an indisputable and inalienable right to return to their historic homeland. It is unsurprising, then, that Israel have, has responded in the only way it knows how, through brute force. Annexation and population transfer in and around Jer in the Jerusalem area is merely the latest installment of the Israelization project to dominate and control the land of historic Palestine. Until this reality is reckoned with by, by the international community and its policymakers, the situation can only get worse before it gets better. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, Mohammed, and thank you very much uh, to the Palestine Center and Jerusalem Fund for organizing this event. And it's always uh, a real pleasure for me to come back uh, to one of my homes, as I call one of my intellectual homes, as I consider it. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with my colleagues. Um, so you've heard from Zina and Yara about the situation on the ground and the continuous process of decolonization that's been going on since 1948 and that actually, for which the ground was laid uh, at, at the turn of the century. Uh, I want to focus in my, in my talk on the narrative and discourse that we use uh, to describe this struggle. And as part of that, I want to also emphasize, uh, the, discuss the importance of emphasizing not just what Palestinians are fighting against, but what they are fighting for. Um, and finally, I also want to touch on some of the sources of power that Palestinians have to achieve these goals. So when it comes to the narrative, there's a lot of debate, particularly in academic circles, about what framework of analysis, how should we understand the Palestinian question and what happened? Is it a question of settler colonialism or ethnic cleansing or racial discrimination or apartheid? In fact, you can make a strong case for any one of these and many more frameworks of analysis. Um, but it is important to agree on a common framing because without it, there's a lack of clarity about the strategies um, that are needed to succeed. My colleague, my Shabaka colleague, Ingrid Jadodat, and I reviewed a number of frameworks um, in a recent Al Shabaka policy paper. <clears throat> and uh, we identified apartheid as the most strategic framework that should be applied to this struggle, <coughs> to this question. In other words, it's strategic because it is most useful to the Palestinian struggle for rights. For example, the settler colonial uh, framework, which is beloved of, of many academics, um, is, is strategic in many ways, but it was not expressly prohibited by international law at the time that Israel was established. So this means that it would only be applicable to Israel's settler colonial enterprise in the occupied territories under international law. And it could not be used to address the rights of the refugees or equality for the Palestinian citizens of Israel. In addition, although settler colonialism was prohibited, it was not criminalized. Um, in the case of Palestine, you can make the case that um, the settler colonial society, that, that apartheid began when the settler colonial society transformed into the state of Israel. So Israel actually bears re, uh, legal responsibility for acts of apartheid against all Palestinians, including the refugees, the citizens of Israel, and those under occupation. Now, there's much more on this in the UN report by Richard Falk and Virginia Tilly that was withdrawn under pressure. There's also more in my El Shabaka paper with Ingrid. And uh, as I think uh, Mohammed mentioned, um, uh, there is a sign-up sheet uh, at the door. So if you want to be on our email list and to get regular uh, Palestinian analysis, um, please do sign up and check out this paper and others um, online. Um, so if we can establish the apartheid framework as our common framing of what we are fighting against, that would be a major source of power for the Palestinian people and for the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Now, if that's what we're fighting against, what are we fighting for? And this is where the discussion slips always into a debate about one state versus two states. Is that what we should be pursuing? Is that what we should be going for? But let's think about that for a moment. 
In terms of achieving Palestinian rights, what would a one state do that two states would not? Um, see, he agrees with me, I like that. <laughs> the vision of a secular democratic state in all of Palestine, as set out by the PLO in 1968, has always been more compelling for the Palestinian people than that of two states. I mean, we, we need to recognize this. Through a single state, Palestinians would exercise their right to self-determination in the entirety of the land that had been Palestine under the mandate, alongside the Jews living there with equal rights for all. But when we come to discuss the two-state uh, uh, vision, it's important to discuss between the one that was set, at, it's important, sorry, to distinguish between that, the vision that was set out in 1988 when the Palestinian National Council adopted it and the disaster uh, that was set out in the Oslo Accords. When it was adopted in 1988, the two-state solution was seen as a pragmatic, doable recognition of reality. Palestinians would exercise the right to self-determination through a sovereign state that would secure the equal rights of its citizens. The 1988 uh, Palestinian National Council resolution also upheld the UN resolutions regarding the rights of the Palestinian refugees. And the struggle for two states does not mean forsaking the vital struggle for the equality of the Palestinian citizens of Israel. In any case, Oslo doomed any kind of rights-based project from the start. The Palestinian leadership was willing to sacrifice refugee rights. There was no reference to uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And as for the Israeli side, even the so-called great peacemaker Yitzhak Rabin made it clear that Palestinians would have an entity that was less than a state and that the Israeli uh, security border would be located in the Jordanian Valley, i.e. extending over uh, the entire West Bank. But, and here's the thing, and here's why I want to discuss the sources of power that are needed. Had the Palestinians built up enough power to ensure that this two-state solution had stayed faithful to its original framing, then this approach could have fulfilled the right to self-determination and return, just as the one state would have. Plus, and this is a very important point, fulfilling Palestinian rights needs some of the sources of power that associated with uh, the state system. For example, under international law, um, states believe that Israel has no right to uh, uh, annex and colonize East Jerusalem. In fact, it has no right to West Jerusalem. Um, under, the, under international law, obviously, the settlements are illegal. These are sources of power that should not be given up until Palestinian goals are achieved. So just to summarize that piece of the discussion, either uh, state outcome, one or two, could be made to achieve Palestinian rights if there are sufficient uh, power to do so, if there is sufficient power to do so. And it's, it's useful to remember that this was the smart strategic choice of the founders of the BDS, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement. Recognizing that the Palestinian people had very little power uh, at present, they focused on rights instead of on political outcomes because there was no power to actually influence or realize a political outcome. So the BDS call is for the realization of self-determination through freedom from occupation, equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel, and justice for Palestinian refugees in fulfilling their rights of return. Freedom, justice, equality. This is how the BDS movement reached the, a broad spectrum of Palestinian society and a very broad spectrum of international solidarity activists in, for Palestinian rights. And they built a considerable source of power um, by giving the Palestine Solidarity Movement specific actions they could take. Now, when it comes to the question of narrative, in my view, the three goals of the BDS, we often, when we talk about BDS, we often talk about the strategy and the tactics, but we rarely talk about the goals. The three goals of BDS capture very well what the Palestinian narrative should emphasize, not just what Palestinians are against, Israel's violations of international law and apartheid, but also what Palestinians are for. And Israel continues to dominate uh, the narrative in the West, despite inroads by Palestinians and by the Solidarity Movement. This domin dominance of the narrative can be challenged by a narrative that communicates what Palestinians are for until the time comes for a political outcome. And that unifying narrative already exists. 
it's freedom, it's justice, it's equality. This speaks uh, to, to goals all human beings can aspire to. It speaks to the reality of each segment of the Palestinian people, whether they're under occupation in Israel or in refugee camps and exiles. What this narrative would make clear is that human rights advocates support BDS because they want to achieve freedom, justice, and equality. They are against apartheid because they want to achieve freedom, justice, and equality. So far, um, and so I think that getting the narrative right would be a major source of power. So um, in my last few remarks, I want to touch on the sources of power available to the Palestinians. I've already mentioned three. The first, the fact that what Israel is doing is illegal under international law. Um, second, uh, which is a source of power that the Palestinian leadership should be using, but is not. Um, second is the strategic use of BDS. That's a, that's a very good source of power. And third, a narrative that communicates what the Palestinian people are for, not just what they're against. There is a fourth source of power. There are many, but I'm just singling out these four. There's a fourth source of power, which is the ability and determination of the Palestinian people to mobilize for their rights over the last hundred years. There is, of course, everyday uh, resistance to, uh, to stay on the land as Palestinians try to stay on their land, which is called sumud, which is Arabic for steadfastness. There's a continuous flowering in culture and the art, uh, both with, within historic Palestine as well as amongst refugees and exiles as Palestinians tell their story. But if you think about it, looking back, every 10 or 20 years, there's a major uprising or mobilization. Think back, think back for example, to the great Palestinian uprising of 36, uh, 39, which stands out in Palestinian <coughs> history. And even though by, by now it has failed, still the effort to organize Palestinian refugees and exile into the, into the PLO, into a national liberation movement, was another major mobilization. Um, and despite repeated setbacks and many mistakes, the PLO did impose <coughs> itself and its advocacy for Palestinian rights on the world stage. There's been other mobilizations. In 1976, uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel rose up in Land Day. Um, even as Israel drove the PLO away from the borders, all the borders uh, abutting Palestine with its invasion of Lebanon in 1982, during that time, a new wave of struggle uh, began to be built for Palestinian rights um, in, uh, by the Palestinians under occupation, uh, uh, and that led to the first Intifada in 87. The launch of the BDS movement in 2005 was another mobilization <coughs> because it mobilized international civil society uh, around targeted peaceful actions that could be taken against Israeli policies. Last summer, they were, there was an uprising by Jerusalemites against um, um, with support of the Palestinian citizens of Israel in mass peaceful protests that stopped Israel's attempt to change the status uh, quo at Al-Aqsa Mosque. And as Zina mentioned, since March 30th of this year, there's been the great march of return spearheaded by the Palestinians besieged in Gaza um, and at, at, at very great risk, risk to life and limb, which has imposed itself on the world stage despite a multitude of other crises. So even though Palestinians have not been able to achieve uh, human rights in the land of Palestine, it's very clear that steadfastness and mobilization will continue to challenge Israel's policies of apartheid, as well as the current Palestinian leadership's defeatism and collaboration, and the international community's acquiescence in this injustice until justice is done. Thank you very much. Thank you all for a wonderful talk. Uh, we'll have now take some questions. So do you have any questions? I have just a small one uh, for you, Yara. When you talked about the 130 plus designations of nationalities in Israel, um, can you tell us how many of those break up Jews? I mean, are the is Jewish one or is there Ashkenazi, Sephardi, that sort of thing? And then a second question, can you give us the population numbers on um, Mizrahi Palestinians in Israel 
and West Bankers in Gaza together versus the Jewish Israeli population? Yeah, and, and that's an interesting question because I think I, I know where you're going with that. Um, so the 137 different nationalities, um, the, the Jewish nationality is not broken up into Ashkenazi, um, Zerahi and Sephardi. Um, uh, and the reason for that is because they they want to maintain a sort of um, legally and constitutionally, they want to maintain a, a unified Jewish nationality. Socially and politically, that's a, that's a bit different because, of course, there is an elitism in Israel in which Ashkenazi Jews, which are uh, white European uh, Jews, are at the top of the, the level, uh, and then uh, Jews of color um, are sort of below that, and then we have Palestinian citizens of Israel right at the bottom. Um, now, the second part of your question is interesting because, um, in reality, um, Israel is actually an Arab country, and that sounds quite strange, but that's because 50% of Israel's population um, is Mizrahi Jewish, which is uh, Jews from, who originate from Arab countries. Then you take 21% who are Palestinians. So really, you're left with 29-ish uh, percent who are Ashkenazi uh, European Jews. So the European uh, Jews are actually in the minority. Um, now, from the river to the sea, if we're including the West Bank, um, Palestinians uh, and Israeli Jews are pretty much equal in number, and that um, and that was the case at the end of 2017. And that's quite worrying for Israel, because Israel is very, very uh, obsessed with demographics. So we're looking at nearly 7 million for each Palestinians, which includes West Bank Palestinians, Gazans, Palestinian citizens of Israel, and then Jewish Israelis. But then if you break down the Jewish Israeli population, you know, that's divided along, you know, uh, different ethnic lines as well. So it's, it, it's very troubling for Israel to see this sort of demographic change. And that's one of the reasons why it does employ this system of apartheid, um, because it, it has to control a population which is not in the minority, um, which with you know, other settler colonial enterprises, they were able to control the indigenous population because they were such a small uh, number. But for the Palestinians, they're now equal in number within historic Palestine. I mean, they're double that if you include the diaspora. Um, and you saw that practice being, um, um, uh, you saw that also being practiced in South Africa. The white South Africans had to employ a tactic of apartheid because black South Africans uh, were, were in the majority. Um, so I think it's very important to, to keep in mind uh, demographics. And thank you for, for bringing it up. I hope that answered your question. Thank you all so much for your talks. Um, Yara, I wanted to just uh, follow up with you. You spoke at the end of your talk about normalization. And I know there are a lot of debates among Palestinians all over, you know, not just, of course, um, West Bank, Gaza, in Israel, and in the diaspora about normalization. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, um, just to hear more. Yep, so normalization was a, a concept sort of developed by BDS. Um, and as I said in the talk, it, it, it refers to, um, 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 it basically argues that Israel shouldn't be treated like a normal country. Um, and that has different um, uh, implications or, or um, how that's carried out is different in, in, in different areas. So BDS internationally fun functions very differently to how BDS functions in the West Bank or in Israel. So Palestinian citizens of Israel, and this is like a, a relatively newish development and it's constantly in progress have sort of are, are having these debates among themselves and having lots of workshops and discussions on how um, how to navigate um, such a system because the state is you know they, they live within the state of Is Israel and all the services and all the institutions they're, uh, they're from the state so it's a very it, it remains a gray area. There are some things that are very clear, but it remains a gray area as to what is necessary um, interaction and what is not necessary interaction. And the, the people that are really sort of pushing and develop, developing this within uh, 48 is the artist and the cultural community, who many of which are saying are refusing state funding. 
um, and that's to their detriment because it means that they have limited funds. They have to go and get funds from outside. Um, and Israel is actually making it harder for them to get funds from outside through various different legislative practices. But it's actually this group and this community that are pushing um, um, for sort of um, anti-normalization. Um, and um, in the West Bank, it manifests itself a bit differently, similar, but also a bit differently. Um, and a lot of the, the BDS focus in the West Bank um, uh, is around produce. Um, in terms of the cultural and art scene, it's about not including um, people who, or like there was a issue recently with a, a film in, in the West Bank that was shown, um, or that was supposed to be shown, um, but then it wasn't because the director had uh, made a film in which it portrayed Israel as a very normal country and engaged with um, Israeli um, actors, I think, who didn't, who weren't, uh, who didn't speak out against the occupation. So it's sorry, I'm rambling now, but um, it's it's a con the thing about BDS is that it's a con there are guidelines, but also these guidelines need to be constantly updated and discussed because it's not a, a clear situation. Mm -hmm. If, if I might just add to that, I, I uh, had an interview with Omar Barhouti about uh, a year and a half, two years ago, um, in which we discussed uh, these gray areas and uh, the challenges of dealing uh, with, with many different kinds of, uh, of, of issues that are raised by, um, by engaging in BDS, uh, especially the gray areas, because especially it, there, there's always uh, room for discussion when it comes to, to culture and the arts. So I would encourage you all to look it up. Did you want to ask? Uh, yeah. Um, since we are speaking about narrative, you know, one of the problems um, I think uh, in speaking to people in here is really language and words. And uh, words like settlement or colonies. These are very much part of American history itself. Mm -hmm. They do not really have uh, like negative uh, connotations like they do uh, for us. Until you begin to explain what a settlement is, which is always very difficult. You need kind of quick words to communicate with. And uh, this is, you know, the word apartheid is also very difficult really to, if you are talking to an ordinary person who is not really in politics, what is apartheid? I mean, it is a very difficult kind of concept until, so maybe um, trying to find uh, new, not concepts, at least a, a new wording, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like racial whatever, you know, uh, separation rather mm -hmm. than talking apartheid, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, one of the other words that I, I always kind of was bothered by <coughs> is the green line. What is the green line? Who made it? Why do we use it, really? Wh what does it mean for us? What does it mean for uh, the Israelis? So I think our language kind of maybe needs to be also refreshed. <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that just very briefly, um, this is something I, I've always struggled with and I think, um, you know, words have meaning and have value and how we deploy them is, is sort of, it, they can either be a weapon in your arsenal or they can be a point of weakness. Um, I think what's, what's interesting is that, for instance, in French, the word for settlements is colonies. And in, whereas here in America, like, you, you know, the colonial period is actually a revered period of their history. And, and how they understand their sort of national identity. And so being able to deploy a universal uh, language that will tackle what's happening on the ground in Palestine, Israel is very complicated. Um, I think for ease, we've, not ease, but as in for, for clarity, there are certain words that all communities who speak about this issue um, use. So for instance, apartheid is a framework that was not, we don't, you know, it's not a word that's used by accident. It's come about through rigorous interrogation of, you know, uh, apartheid phenomenon in South Africa, among other places. Um, but yes, and I think also just a sort of tangential point on the green line particularly is that one of the th struggles I always face when dealing with this issue or speaking to people who aren't very well versed in it is that whenever I use 
um, whenever I bring up the Palestine-Israel conflict or conflict, they'll always say, oh, it's too complicated. That's a, a frequent trope that, that everyone will just disengage and say, well, it's too complicated to go into. And actually, I think that concept is a propaganda tool. It, it's used to obfuscate um, moral responsibility from it. But when you look at the details, you realize Israel has made it a very complicated system. You know, areas A, B, and C, Hebron has decided you know, split into different zones. Yara broke down the hundred and however many uh, ethnic delineations. Um, and things like the Green Lion does require a level of expert knowledge, which is hard to impress upon the layman. So I think it, I mean, it's something that I think solidarity groups should uh, be a bit more critical about interrogating as how to, finding a, a suitable way of explaining the, the reality on the ground as, you know, a settler colonial project or a process of ethnic cleansing um, effectively, succinctly, without dwelling on things like explaining the Green Line or explaining Oslo or explaining the many moving parts of, frankly, a quite dizzying system. Mm -hmm. yeah, to that, I mean, I couldn't agree more. The language is very important. Um, and the language you use applies to different audiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, so this is a very well-informed audience, so we are using the language that, that we well informed here and, and and the ones who are listening in so so we're using language that we are all um, familiar with but um, and and the framework of analysis that I'm putting forward I think is is a framework of analysis um, for for the Palestine solidarity movement so the people who are going to take the time to sit down and and understand what's happened and or, or Palestinians themselves, you know, um, and what to do about it. But when you speak to broader audiences or when you speak on the media, then you really need to use sh short, clear words. I mean, even a term like ethnic cleansing, that's that's uh, you know not not known for people, uh, and so on. And um, I mean, uh, certainly at the Shabaka, we try to make our materials as accessible as pos possible. But then that's the value of putting of speaking to what you're working for, not what you're working against. And what you're working for is freedom, justice, equality. These are three words that everybody around the world can understand what they're meaning. Their meaning is very simple. So, you know, when you're speaking to, to, to mainstream or broad audiences or whatever, I think it's really important to push uh, what, what you're speaking for, what you're, what you're uh, working for. And, um, I, I do have a, a, an issue that I, I frequently discuss with, with colleagues who work in the BDS movement, um, that you know, you, you've identified these three goals, speak to them. You, you know, say that this is what you're about. Don't say, don't keep saying that, that what, what you're against. I think it would be a, a major source of power if we were able to use that narrative. Just, yeah, yeah, please. Um, just to respond to the, the word apartheid, I, I agree with um, what Nadia said it depends on the audience. Now, apartheid um, is important as a term because it has a legal connotation. It's illegal, it's a, it's a crime against humanity. And so when we use it, we use it for that reason. Um, whereas colonialism is, we, we can't do much about it within the international law framework, unfortunately. Um, but, I mean, what does apartheid mean? It's an Africana word and it means se separation. Um, so we can use racial segregation or separation and actually, the um, some colleagues who will remain nameless in the international community in Palestine, they use the term racial separation or segregation because it's much more palatable um, to uh, among people who are terrified of the word apartheid. But it means the same thing. And they're using that word because they know that they can talk about it without having the conversation immediately shut down. Because if they use the word apartheid, that conversation would be shut down. But the two are interchangeable. I mean, they mean the same thing. Just to follow up on the <coughs> apartheid point, um, I agree with you that it, it should be the strategic framework. And the question that I would have is, I assume you mean not only grand apartheid, but also the petty apartheid that, that you saw in South Africa. Um, and has any thought been given to morphing 1761, which is the anti-apartheid resolution at the UN, into language that would be applicable? To the Palestinian issue. Um, you know that's a very good uh, point and very good question. Um, 
I, I'm not sure. I think my colleagues would, uh, uh, Ingrid Jaradat, who, who co-authored the, the paper, the Shabaka paper I mentioned uh, with me, would be able to uh, um, respond to whether um, uh, an attempt has been made to, to make that, that resolution more accessible. I don't, and, and maybe Yara and, and Zina would know. But if not, then I think that's a very good idea, and we should, we should pick up on it. I had a question. So, you know, here, if I told, you know, if, if there was a suburb in the D.C. area and they had an admissions committee where African Americans weren't allowed to live, uh, or like you mentioned uh, with the voting in I mean, if a politician was, was saying, oh, the African Americans are coming out in droves, I mean, that would be something completely unacceptable here. I mean, it would be, you know, it's just, it would be shocking. Uh, the the problem is people here, uh, you know, people don't know that that's how it is in in Palestine. So how can we increase awareness about this? Because I think if the average American, or at least the one that's slightly interested in politics or you know in global issues, if they knew or understood these details, I think they would speak up more. Uh, so what's the best way to go about increasing the awareness about the situation? So I guess my initial comment or my initial response would be this does happen in America. You know, redlining is not a new phenomenon. It was from the creation of the state. It was always intended to have black people apart or other indigenous people killed or removed. You know, um, similarly, if you look at voter registration patterns or you look at the very complicated apparatus that comes with where polling booths are placed, how people get registered, it's clear that African-Americans have been um, written out of the democratic process. So I don't think um, that this is sort of a unique phenomenon um, to a flawed democracy in, known as the Israeli state. I would say the difference is that's perhaps much more scandalous is that Israel is brazen in its... In yeah, it's very uh, explicit. Yeah, it doesn't try to hide it. And often it's quite proud of it. Often it's like, you know, we all need to realize that this is a reality and we should, we should get on and, and sort this out. Whereas I think if an American did that here... Actually, I mean, under the current administration, I think it's important to stress that there are similarities that run across the board that we need to um, be honest with ourselves about and call a spade a spade. Um, but to your point that, you know, that if they knew part, um, the information is out there. I mean, it's not, this isn't something that's been hidden. This isn't something that is, um, you know, misunderstood. I actually have found that while Americans haven't been as informed as I would personally like, I found that coming to America, I have met a... a a huge amount of people who are at least have a nominal understanding of the situation in Palestine, and and it's the the problem is less that they're not hearing about it, and more that Palestinian life is valued differently um, than Israeli life. Palestinian there is nothing cheaper than Palestinian blood, and so um, to have a Palestinian death or to have um, any sort of, of numerous crimes committed against Palestinians, it's less about getting the information across and more attaching importance or significance to that event. And I think that's where actually the, the conversation really needs to change. There needs to be um, a leveling of the playing field in that all life is sacred and, and Palestinian life is no exception to that and reframing it that way. And just as a final remark, I think something that I've struggled with a lot and, and has um, even just in my own approach to uh, talking about this issue in American spaces, is that speaking about it is in, in installments is is o only sort of works half of the time. You know, mentioning, um, picking up the story of, oh, well, this is what's happening right now, or um, this is a sort of apartheid structure they've got in this particular place. I think often it's important to go right back to, you know, the original sin of its creation, which was the expulsion of Palestinian people and the refugee crisis that ensued. And I think often just creating awareness that that is where a lot of these issues have come from. So what we're seeing, you know, whether, you know, the apartheid system, um, indiscriminate killing, violation of international law, these aren't, uh, you know, freak accidents of, of a democratic process. These are integral to a project uh, which, you know, predicates that an ethno-religious um, group have, you know, t take paramount. And I think um, it's important to go right back to that original um, sin and in some ways look at it as a parallel to what's happening in the American context whereby, you know, this country had its own indigenous folk and you saw what happened to them and being able to ally it that way is quite an effective tool to getting the point across. Um, 
Can I, can I just... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just quickly to respond, also I think Palestinians need to be more involved in social justice issues locally and draw the connections uh, between all these greater structures of power because what is happening in Palestine is horrendous, um, but it is very much connected to all these other global issues that are going on. Let's not forget that um, uh, American police officers during the time of Ferguson were trained in Israel to deal with protest, uh, African-American protesters here. So I think by sort of joining other struggles, this is a really great way to sort of to, to share and educate, and, and they're all connected, you know, um, not to be too cheesy, but, you know, our, our freedom relies on everyone else's freedom as well. Thank you very much, and you've kind of broadened the uh, canvas a little bit, the framework, and I'd like to uh, take it somewhat further. Uh, since uh, President Trump's uh, declaration on Jerusalem, preceded by a Russian declaration, uh, a number of things have happened that uh, have, in a way, been helpful to the Palestinian cause. And I wonder, in this context, whether you could address the role of Iran, which uh, has accepted now the Arab peace proposal, <laughs> and also the role of Russia, which has uh, good relations with Israel, but with everybody else in the region, uh, including Palestinians in Israel and the West Bank and so on. And uh, you might have, I'm sure you noticed that uh, they uh, pretty quickly identified the uh, recent uh, F-15 strike by the Israelis uh, in, uh, in Syria. Just before that, can you uh, just sort of shed some light on what positive things have happened since the Jerusalem Declaration? Well, right for now? example, the Palestinians have been reinvigorated in their determination to uh, resist. Uh, a number of states have come out and recognized uh, the uh, Palestinian cause, and I think a couple more. Uh, Palestine is a... Uh, diplomatic and other types of recognition. The EU made a uh, good statement. Uh, the, uh, the Islamic Conference came out and said uh, uh, very uh, clearly that uh, they support uh, East Jerusalem as the capital of future Palestinian state. So, I mean, I think there are other things that uh, uh, have happened uh, and uh, I've identified a few and you probably uh, know some others. Well, do you want to? Um, well, I can just say initial remark. Okay. Um, well, I just, I guess, first to say that I don't, um, with all due respect, I'm not sure if I see those as uh, successes or good things to happen towards the Palestinians. I see it almost as sort of a meager damage control that's happening. Um, uh, but just to to the wider point of you know Iran and the and the regional. Um, seen, as it were. I think what's happening, and we saw this particularly with the visit of uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, over the last few weeks, is that there's this real, uh, the Middle East is kind of setting itself up for quite a show between different regional actors. And of course, you have sort of the Iran, uh, sort of Syria, Fertile Crescent uh, contingency, and then you have the sort of allyship between Saudi Arabia, the West, particularly the US, um, the Gulf states, um, Egypt, and that, you know, Palestine is one is but one uh, element in that. Yemen, of course, is another factor. Syria also uh, factors in. I'm not sure. I, I'm skeptical with good reason uh, as to how that would help the Palestinians in any uh, in any case. I think what's actually ended up happening is that Palestinians yet again are being thrown under the bus. There's this increased rhetoric of uh, Arab states growing weary of the Palestinian cause or of the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I think there's a general fatigue setting in and also the, the idea that, you know, Palis we're approaching 70 years since the creation of the State of Israel and the, um, you know, the birth of the Palestinian problem, as it were. Um, and it's just on the back burner, you know, there keep being other, you know, slippages and, and issues and fissures that are happening and erupting across the Arab world, which always seem to kind of take prevalence. And, you know, here we see Yemen, here we see um, you know, the, the Arab Spring or and whatever it was that always somehow seems to trump the Palestinian issue, but the Palestinian issue just rolls on um, endlessly. And I think that that becoming the norm is actually what we're in da is in danger um, here when we talk about Jerusalem and other sort of more current affairs. Mm 
Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, just to build on that, um, that, uh, you know, there's the geopolitics of the region, then there's what's, what's going on the, on the ground. And there's been a move for the last uh, uh, several months to wrap up the Palestinian. I mean, I would agree that things are not terribly hopeful. Um, uh, there's been a move for the last several months to wrap up the Palestinian question, uh, to try and get Abbas to move aside, uh, install someone, either for him to sign off on a, on a deal that, a deal that would, would basically uh, limit Palestinian uh, existence to a few parcels of land in the West Bank uh, under Israeli control in perpetuity. I mean, so uh, consolidating an apartheid reality uh, uh, which, which currently exists over all uh, the land of Palestine. Um, and so uh, uh, what, what, and then there's the Syrian-Iranian um, Hezbollah alliance uh, and, and uh, pa there are different Palestinian parties trying to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis that and trying to resist the plans by, let's say, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and the Trump administration um, to, uh, to settle the conflict on Israel's terms. Um, so I think we're entering a very dangerous phase, actually, with uh, you know the ascendance or, of John Bolton, and uh, okay. you know the, any number of things could go very badly wrong or blow up at any time. I think what the Gaza uh, return march has shown is that try as you will to impose something on the Palestinian people, there will always be some kind of mobilization, some kind of uprising that will resist it. And so I see the, the, um, uh, I see the issue going on for a lot longer with things getting, getting much worse, uh, perhaps. But then, you know, that doesn't stop us working towards making them eventually at the end much better. I just want to say uh, just one thing not related to your, uh, the issues you raised, but about the discourse. Um, and how do we spread the word? Uh, yes, intersectionality. Yes, uh, drawing attention to uh, uh, the root causes. But also organized, uh, persistent communication, organized, persistent outreach. Um, if you look at how Israel functions and their allies function, they're, they're, on, they're in the ascendant. They're winning. But they work 24-7 on getting their messages out. Um, the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the Palestinians are not only hampered by having a leadership that does not support this kind of push, um, but also by resources and so on. Nevertheless, it's remarkable how the, sh the shift in discourse that's happening in the United States, which is so far away from the rest of the world and somewhat, somewhat isolated, um, due to, to, I would say, two decades of persistent organizing and outreach that, that has penetrated. So just to... Can I, uh, can I respond yeah. to yes, um, Trump, uh, Trump's statement on Jerusalem? So I, I live in Palestine, and um, whilst all the sort of reactions to Trump may have seemed positive from here, you know, all these statements of reasserting that East Jerusalem is the capital. Um, That's not far from the case. You're not seeing positive from here. Okay. Uh, well, a lot of people, but maybe responding to what you said, that the EU said a strong statement and all these strong statements, strong statements. Well, and in addition, President Abbas has internationalized uh, the negotiation in quotes yeah. by saying that uh, the U.S. can no longer serve as a credible mediator, which was obvious, but I mean, now it's been mm. stated. And, you know, there's talk about, uh, you know, That's Russia right. and France and so on, perhaps uh, taking a more active role. That's certainly a yeah. positive outcome. I think on the ground what was felt, though, by many Palestinians is that... Um, you know, when he said that statement and there was this huge reaction to it, people were like, because the reality is that things haven't changed. The co Jerusalem is continuously being colonized and now it's accelerating, but the things on the grounds haven't changed. And even with all these strong statements of reasserting that East Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine or a future Palestinian state and that it's Palestinian land, the diplomatic community in Jerusalem is not doing much. Um, apart from releasing these statements. Now, where they could perhaps be stronger in doing something, I mean, you know, they could, they, in their hands, they're capable of physically uh, preventing demolitions. 
preventing settlement expansion. They could go and park their big cars in front of the bulldozers, or they could provide bu um, anti uh, bulldozer uh, blocks or you know there's a lot of things that could be done to actually stop the physical colonization of East Jerusalem but it's simply not being done and the only thing that that was done was these sort of statements of of support so I think um, support for East Jerusalem as the the capital of a future Palestinian state so I think there is a sort of diplomatic paralysis um, people are not actually willing to do something more material, more tangible. Okay, uh, I think we are. We'll take one more question. Hi, I, as usual, found um, Nadia Hijab's um, presentation very um, compelling, and uh, I, um, I found it very, very interesting, um, your uh, analysis of why one narrative or one framework is more useful uh, from the point of view of international law than another, and why uh, one state versus two states that you know both can be seen as providing um, an answer to the the main things that we're uh, fighting for. But I'd li I'd like to go a little bit further. I'd like you to um, talk more about. Okay, so then then what? Um, how um, how can this be used, and what do you imagine um, happening as further steps along the way in this very dangerous and troubling international climate? Um, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think if it's going to be used, it has to uh, be much more widely disseminated to begin with. Um, and discuss with a lot of people uh, to, to bring people on board because not everybody obviously agrees with it. Some people have strong disagreement uh, um, with it. I mean, I, uh, a group of academics um, uh, late last year got together, uh, sort of quite um, uh, well-established Palestinian academics to make a, a case for settler colonial framework being the framework of analysis, in fact. So there's kind of a clash of frameworks uh, happening. But just to disseminate it much more widely, um, also perhaps to reach out to the BDS uh, 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 community and say, you know, uh, uh, please start speaking to what, what you're for and, and not what you're against. Um, and, and, you know, or just organizing around it that, that uh, to, to, to be able to project a more accessible um, and, and uh, uh, image that can, be, that can be engaged with. Okay. Yara, Zina, Nadia, thank you so much for an informative discussion. And then please, uh, please remember we have a sign-up sheet for Al Shabaka and for everybody online you can go to their website and sign up on their email list. So thank you again for, for the discussion.